Hello, I'm Michael Kurland, CEO and co-founder of Branded Group, an award-winning facility maintenance and construction management company that services multi-site commercial properties, such as retail, restaurants, healthcare facilities, and educational institutions. Welcome to the Be Better podcast. Each week, I interview thought leaders from a variety of industries who will share their stories and the lessons they learn as they strive to be better for their clients, partners, employees, and their community. Are you ready to be better? Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Be Better podcast. I am your host, Michael Kurland. Joining me today is Vic Maholtra, senior partner at McKinsey and author of CEO Excellence, the six mindsets that distinguish the best leaders from the rest. Vic, welcome to the show. Please tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Well, thank you, Michael. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, who am I and what do I do? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I'm an immigrant into the United States. I uh, grew up in India, Cyprus, and the United Kingdom. Uh, got here to come to business school. Uh, went to business school at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton Business School, and came right out of that to McKinsey 36 years ago. I am the oldest and longest tenured senior partner at McKinsey by some distance at this point. Uh, I've, I've been doing what I've been doing for a long time, and I'm very passionate about what I do. Uh, McKinsey and Company, as some of you may know, is a global management consulting company. We help CEOs and C-suite uh, leaders solve their toughest problems or work with them to so help them solve their toughest problems. Um, and I've done that for 36 years and loved every minute of it. Uh, initial focus on the world of financial services. I live in New York City, so it was a natural place to go. Uh, but over time, I've really started serving a range of industries uh, on, on their big issues. And particularly in the last 10 years, have built a really strong interest in terms of what creates great leaders in general, great leaders in the C-suite and CEO excellence in particular, CEO uh, leadership in particular, board leadership as well. Those are the topics that have been of real excitement and interest to me, um, particularly over the last 10 years. Awesome. And I think, you know, we got we got a big thing to talk about here, which is your book, but and and we talked about a pre-show. It launched about two months ago, and it's been a bestseller at the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, Publishers Weekly, and uh, USA Today. Uh, so I want to get into that because that's a lot of the the depth of our talk today. But I I really want to know like how you got to writing this book and, and what made you so passionate about this. You said you've been with McKinsey thirty six years, mm -hmm. but what what have you done over your time that you've poured into this book that all the experiences that you've had in those 36 yeah. years? Yeah. Well, I should say I've co-authored this with two wonderful people, two fellow senior partners at McKinsey, uh, Carolyn Dewar and Scott Keller. And all three of us have had a real interest over, over time around, you know, what is it that, that, that really makes for excellent CEOs? And we really started out with the premise that it turns out that this role, while it's difficult, it's very hard to do well. You know, it really matters, right? And, and you know, all the research we've done at McKinsey would suggest that the role of a CEO matters. About 50%, 45%, 50 50% of all value created in a company is directly in some way linked to CEO decisions. Um, uh, CEOs are responsible for creating a ton of jobs out there. Uh, CEOs in today's world are more trusted than politicians. I recognize that's a low bar. Uh, but they're actually getting pretty high ratings in terms of the trust factor around, you know, matters of, of, of social impact and social unrest and political issues, the war in Ukraine, as an example. So, you know, they, they've got a real responsibility to play their excellent CEOs. And then, of course, from a shareholder return point of view, truly excellent CEOs in sector after sector after six, sector, every year return 3x more in terms of shareholders' returns than the other four quintiles, uh, if they're in the top quintile. And you do that, as Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan Chase has done for 17 years in a row, you really start differentiating yourself uh, from, a, from a shareholder return point of view. So 
for all of these reasons, we started getting into, you know, if the, the, these facts really support the importance of great CEOs. So we said, okay, but well, what really defines excellent CEOs? Why, what do they do and how do they do it? And that's really what led us to writing the book. Very nice. And you mentioned a lot of good points there. I think the one thing that I can resonate with is the creation of and also the taking away of jobs. I, as a CEO, take that very seriously. When, you know, when I hire someone, I feel uh, when the company hires someone, I feel a great responsibility because we're not just supporting this person, but also their family and, and all their endeavors and what they're trying to do. And when we you know, have to terminate someone from time to time. We also have to take that into consideration. And does this person, you know, if they've done something egregious and they've and and they have a blase attitude, it's one thing, right? But if they've really poured their heart and soul into the company and they're just not a good fit for the role, is there some way I can pivot this person and get them to still have that job and have that income going into support their family and another role that may benefit? The organization as well. So I thought that was a good point that you brought up. Yeah. No. So, well said, Michael. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you know, let's 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 talk about the book. You, you talked about all these these quint, quint, quintets quintels quintels. Let's quintiles. talk about that quintiles. quintiles. <laughs> let's talk about the quintiles. Let's <clears throat> let's tell the audience exactly what what that is and and what that means. Well, it's it simply means that the top twenty percent. Well. The top 20% of all CEOs in any industry uh, uh, outperform the other 80% in that sector time and time again by 3x. Uh, that's a big differentiation, you know, when you kind of add it up year after year. And so that's, that's really kind of what the facts suggest. So what we then said was, you know, let's go out there and interview the truly excellent CEOs. So we started out basically by looking at the 3,000 plus people who'd been CEOs in the last 25 years of any company of any scale or size, call it Fortune 1000 and larger. And then we said, okay, let's get people who've been enrolled for at least six years. So they've got a real track record. And let's target the people who've been top 20% performance in their industry sector, whether it's healthcare or insur or, fit or, or the banking world or tech. Let's find the people who've been top 20% in terms of performance. And quickly, that group of 3,000 plus CEOs came down to about 200. We reached out to 75 of those 200 and 67 of them agreed to be interviewed for this book. And the book is really about their stories. It's a lot of storytelling around what made them, uh, these great CEOs, excellent. Well, I mean, it sounds like you went to the best of the best of the best and got all the knowledge and put it all into a book. So, I mean, the book is wildly successful, right? It's been out for two months, as we said earlier. It's on all these uh, bestseller lists for weeks running. So let's talk about the book. You know, what we've talked about what you went into, what, what it was that you guys went into wanting to write this book. Let's talk about the book. The, let's talk about the six mindsets. What are these six mindsets that you guys have distinguished as the the, the mindsets for the excellence of CEOs. Yeah. So before I get to the six mindsets, what we what we learned as we talked to these CEOs, these 67 exceptional CEOs, was the responsibilities of the CEOs really boil down to six things. Setting the direction of the company, aligning the organization, mobilizing through leaders, engaging the board and getting the most out of their boards, connecting with stakeholders, internal, yes, but increasingly external stakeholders, and finally managing their own personal energy and effectiveness, right? Now, all great CEOs do these six things, but if there were three big takeaways from these interviews, there would be the following. The first is great CEOs are absolutely fantastic at doing all six of these things really well all of the time. It's not like they do a couple of them well and the other four are okay, right? They do all six of these responsibilities really well all of the time. That was number one. Number two was they're amazing integrators. They set great vision and then they bring organization, the organization together and integrate it all in an amazing way. As 
Satya Nadella, the uh, CEO of Microsoft, put it to us in our interview with him on this. Uh, he said, look, the role of integration is critical because you as the CEO know more than anyone else in your organization. It doesn't matter how good your organization is, how well it's organized, you know more than anyone else in the organization. And you certainly know more than the 10 or 12 people on the board that you report to. So your job around the vision, the integration becomes critical. So that, that was kind of takeaway number two. And takeaway number three was really what the book's about, which is indeed, as you put it, these six mindsets which is against each one of these responsibilities that I laid out earlier, these great CEOs had a very distinct mindset that allowed them to outperform others. So for example, on the topic of set the direction of the company, the mindset that they had was be bold, be bold. Really what you learned from these great, great CEOs was incrementalism or even just trying to go steady as it goes in terms of the company, typically does not re result in outperformance. You only get outperformance when you're bold in terms of your vision, when you're bold in terms of your strategies, when you're bold in terms of programmatic M&A, when you're bold in terms of resource allocation and how you think about where you put your capital dollars and your expense dollars. That just gives you one mindset. I can take you through all six of them if you'd like, but it gives you a sense of how they relate the responsibility, in this case, set the direction, to the mindset, which is be bold. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I would love for you to take us through all six of them, but I'll pause you right here. A couple of things that, that you said and a couple of questions I have and, and anecdotes. Uh, as far as being bold, I can tell you uh, setting setting the direction at, as the CEO of Branded Group and putting the course, I, I definitely agree with that. And being bold is something that I've done since the day we opened. I mean, it's definitely on a smaller scale than the people you've, you've been interviewing. But, you know, from day one, we 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 started in New York as a company and we came out and we said, you know, let's move to California because we saw a hole in the industry of what we do as facility management. There was nobody out here doing what we did. And I sold everything I had, packed up my car, moved across country and started a, a company in California which probably was very bold at the time and still is with all the employment laws, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, and it's worked to our advantage uh, all these years later. But I, I wanted to ask you, you said something, first up, you said something that was very eye-opening to me that the CEO knows more than anyone in the, in the organization at all times. And I've never really thought of it that way. And that, I, I'm the CEO and I'm like, you know what? <laughs> That's right. Like I know more than anyone in the company at all times, which I guess I should have already known, but it just it just kind of like made a light bulb go off. Even my business partners, I know more than them on a high level than of everything all encompassing in, in the organization at all times. And I wouldn't have thought that about myself until you just said that. So that thank you for that little piece of knowledge that I've, I'm going to take away with myself today. There you go. But the last thing I wanted to touch on is you, you said like, getting connecting with the stockholders the shareholders right and and getting them to buy into what the ceo is the vision of the ceo is i want to ask you has has that been affected with the new work remote at all trying to get everyone on the same page has that has there been an issue with that that you've seen with ceos since you've written this book yeah look i i would say that uh, you know uh, the everything that's occurred through the pandemic and with the hybrid has undoubtedly influenced the way these CEOs operate and and how they operationalize their mindset. It doesn't change their mindset, by the way. Uh, you know, another mindset we could talk about is when they seek to align the organization, the mindset there is treat the soft stuff as the hard stuff, by which I mean they put real metrics and hard measures around things like culture and talent. And so it hasn't changed their mindset around what they do, uh, but clearly, uh, you know, when it comes to when it comes to uh, with the remote environment, the onus that it's put on creating buy-in, creating consensus, moving the organization forward, has clearly gone up. I, 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 you know, you know, there's there's no doubt about it that that ability to 
that ability to kind of, you know, be in a, the same room together, connect with people, bring them along has, has clearly gone up, right? So they recognize that and they, they, they've kind of gone to other means to deal with it. That said, though, there's also been some advantages, right? So the advantages is, you know, take, you got to bring your board along, right? It's easier to convene your board remotely, uh, then kind of have them all together all the time, right? So if you need to bring your board along, you need multiple meetings on a particular issue, they can do that more often. Uh, I've seen a lot of CEOs uh, it, through the pandemic actually find ways in ways that they would never have done in the more physical environment to actually reach down into their organizations and connect with people, you know, one, two, three, four levels down in the organization just to kind of communicate a point or get something done. Um, so remote has actually been for them both a, it's made some things more difficult from a communications and a vision and a boldness point of view, but it's also helped enable getting getting some some parts of consensus done even done quicker than it used to get done. Yeah, I, I think you made a lot of good points and, and you're really m making the wheels turn in my head on this Monday, California Monday morning. But <laughs> um, I think for what I've witnessed as the CEO of our company that has gone full, fully remote and that did have a great culture before the pandemic when we were in the office. And, and we still, I would say we still do have a great culture, but it's very hard to get that messaging out to everyone all the time when it's across Zoom, because you can't get everyone on a Zoom call like you could rally everyone around the water cooler when you're in the office. So, I mean, you can, but it, you know, you're stopping a whole day to do that now. So I think that's the hardest thing that I found is trying to, to push that culture forward. And what I've found from my stakeholders, my shareholders in the company is it's easier for someone to hide now if they don't want to be a part of that culture, if they don't want to be front and center, if they don't want to participate, they can just hide behind their desk and on, on you know, not, not engage. But to your point, and I was thinking it right before you said it, which is crazy, uh, I've been able to connect so much more one-on-one -on -one with people down the line that I probably wouldn't have spent a lot of time and energy with as the CEO. And I've gotten to know some people and I've gotten to help mentor and talk and I don't know if I've shaped, but hopefully given them at least some good advice and thought process on on what, you know, what it means to be an employee at Brandon Group and what the expectations are in a good way. And I think that that is something is a silver lining that I didn't I probably didn't think of until you were just talking right now. So, right. I, yeah. More reason that I'm going to go buy this book as soon as we get off off this yeah. podcast. Yeah. here. So I, if I may, just one quick comment. Sure. I do think that to your point of all that's going on. I mean, I think communications in many ways, yes, they're challenges, but it can also be an enhanced in this in this remote world. I do think the piece that we're in the early innings of and don't know quite how it's going to play out two, three, four, five, eight years down the road is the cultural aspect, right? What is going to be your ability to shape culture in a remote or hybrid world relative to, you know, mostly a physical and in-person world? I, I think the jury's out on that one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can't, you know, I don't know what you guys did during the hybrid portion, if you're back in the office or not. But for us, it was a lot of Zoom happy hours and Zoom meetings. And like, I don't want to connect with people. I know we're connecting over Zoom right now or some sort of f form of telecommunication. But I don't, I don't think the team wants to do that anymore. I think they're all burnt out and they want to hug someone or give them a high five or you know, share a story in person. And, and uh, that's, that's the thing that I'm struggling the most with. And what we're doing currently is we're going to bring back a once a, a month in office mandatory day where, because everyone likes to work from home, essentially, they don't, you know, and we like it too, because it, we, we find people work harder when you give them the freedom for the most part. You have your outliers, but the, the organization as a whole has really worked harder with not having to commute. And we want to do a once a month now thing where we'll go work in the office and then have a lunch together and have, you know, a happy hour afterwards so that they can get that in-person touch. But anyway, we're way off topic here, but wanted to just bring that up. So 
You, you talked about uh, seek to align and treat the soft stuff as the hard stuff. That was fascinating. Can we talk a little bit more about that and, and your findings on that? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, when, when we talk about, uh, uh, when, we, when we did our research, there's, there's a clearly a responsibility around the CEO as around aligning the organization. And what we found that these great CEOs did was they had a mindset of, as I said, treat the soft stuff as the hard stuff. So they take culture. By the way, they don't, I'll come back to this, they don't try and shape culture whole scale in terms of trying to move 10 elements of the culture. They pick one thing to really move. Uh, but whether it's culture, whether it's talent, whether it's some of these other squishy, you know, amorphous topics, they tend to treat it no differently than they do resource allocation or budgeting or the like. They, they really, uh, you know, they, they define it. They put measurements on it. They put metrics on it. They role model it themselves. They hold themselves and others accountable for it. They compensate on it. So when they're shaping culture or they're shaping talent, they're not doing it in gut feel ways or amorphous ways. They're actually doing it very much the way you would uh, when you think about you know, capital allocation or when you think about budgeting expenses. Um, and and I found that to be kind of interesting. Uh, an interesting finding is that they, you know, what they're trying to shape, they actually do in do in very very measurable ways. Uh, so if I were to give you an example, uh, Kaz Hirai, who was the CEO of Sony, um, one of the things that he wanted to deliver strategically was product excellence and a outstanding customer experience. And he felt he needed to reshape the culture to deliver what this Japanese word uh, is, is kondo. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but loosely translated, it translates to the wow factor. So whether he was in entertainment or in electronics or financial services, he wanted to deliver the wow factor to his customers. If you're talking about the wow factor and if your culture is built on the wow factor and he put metrics around the wow factor, you're really ultimately going to get real product innovation, real cutting edge thinking in terms of quality of products you get out there and real measurements of customer experience. What are your customers experiencing? Are they really loving what they're getting from you in terms of your products? And so he, he spent three years doing nothing but talking and role modeling the wow factor in Sony, and it completely shifted the organization. That's, yeah, that, that, that's very interesting. Very interesting. So <clears throat> you, you, you've made talent now into this uh, kind of like a budgeting thing. You've said the culture is now something that you have to really focus on. So the next one you were talking about was mobilizing. What, what can you talk to me about that? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the responsibility there is mobilizing through leaders, right? And the mindset that these CEOs bring is solve for the team psychology, right? You want to mobilize through leaders, you've got to solve for your immediate team and perhaps the broader team psychology. And if there was one message from these 67 outstanding CEOs, it was the following. It was, don't, don't try and create a team of stars instead focus on creating a star team. You don't want a team of stars, you want a star team, right? And the, the, the analogy, uh, you know, often comes down to, you know, you've seen it on sports teams. The one my co-author, Scott Keller, likes to use is the, is the dream team in 1992 that went to, uh, went to the Olympics. And a little known fact, they lost their very first game uh, to a bunch of very motivated college all-stars who felt that these professionals going to the Olympics was not the right thing. And Michael Jordan and Larry Bird and, you know, Magic Johnson, they didn't play as a team and they lost, right? Team of stars, not playing well together, they lost. Chuck Daly had to kind of motivate them eventually to become a real team. And it's not that different in corporate America or corporate world, which is, you, if you have a team of stars, you have someone who's just kind of focused on their area, their business unit, their function. That's what they do. They excel in it, but they don't collaborate and work well with the rest of the team. You're not going to get the best out of the organization. So the focus comes down to build a star team that works well together, not a team of stars. Uh, I totally agree. We have a saying at Branded Group with that you <laughs> everyone can't be a leader. And if you had everyone that wanted to be a leader, 
we would get nothing done because we need worker bees as well. So you got to also appreciate the people that are happy to not be man in the management role and want to just sit there and work for whoever that manager is. And that hopefully, like you said, mobilize the leaders to do their job. I, I really like what you're saying there. That And that's a great analogy talking about the dream team. And so the next part was you were talking about connecting with, with something, that next yeah. tenant. Well, actually, the next one was uh, these CEOs are amazing at engaging their boards. Um, you know, I've served too many clients who over time look to essentially manage their board. Uh, they they, they want to give them, you know, whatever information they want to give them. They want to kind of get through the board meetings and then they want to kind of get back to work. Right. And the message we basically heard from these great CEOs was, no, 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 you're thinking about it exactly the wrong way. What you want to do is you want to work with your chairperson or your lead director to really shape the board, to have the right people on the board that will help your company for the future. So you need to have skills on the board. If your needs are on marketing or AI or digital or governance or regulatory, have the right people on the board. Give them the right information. Uh, Ivan Menez is a Diageo starts every one of his board meetings, an executive session with what he calls seven plus seven. Here are the seven things I'm really proud of since we last met. Here are the seven things that are keeping me up at night. Total transparency, total openness. And then once you've got the right people on the board and you're, you're being open with them, you, the, real, the real mindset is then help the directors help the business. Don't keep them at an arm's length, which many people, many CEOs do. How do you help the directors help you, the CEO, but also help others in the business to do, do better. So that's kind of the fourth responsibility before we come to the connectedness ones, which I'd be happy to get into as well. Yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about the connectedness. And then the one that I'm looking forward to is the personal energy. That's the one I uh, resonate with the most, but let's of course, talk about connectedness of first. Yeah. So connecting with stakeholders, uh, I, I guess three, three messages that came out of these interviews. Uh, the first was the mindset is really start with the question of why. Why do we exist? Why are we here? Why is this company doing what it's doing? And that in turn then defines what these great CEOs do, right? The bottom line is, interestingly, many of these folks have been CEOs, you know, over the last two decades. So it's not like they're brand new CEOs in today's world where purpose has become a very fashionable word. Uh, these CEOs were talking purpose and defining purpose well before it was fashionable. And that allowed them to have the company be focused from a mission point of view, but it also allowed them to define when we're talking about external stakeholders, who is it important for me to connect with, right? And because everyone realizes, all these great CEOs realize that no longer is, are we single mission focused, right? It's all about the shareholder. We've got to manage for a broader range of stakeholders. And they do, they get that balance really, uh, they, they get it right really well, uh, right? So that's kind of message number one. Message number two is this is taking a lot more time than it used to. If this used to take about 10%, 5% of a CEO's time, now the demands externally are taking 25, 30% of their time. And Peter Vosso's CEO of Shell's case, 50% uh, of his time was really around external stakeholders. So you see the shift occurring on that one. And then the final piece is, uh, you know, the, these CEOs are often faced with crises and challenges, right? Through the, you know, sometimes it's the pandemic comes at you in unexpected ways. Sometimes it's the George Floyd murder and, and social unrest. And, you know, what's your position as a CEO? Sometimes it's, you know, war in Ukraine and what position do I need to take as a CEO? And, you know, these are hard decisions and hard things for them to deal with. And so they anchor back very much on the values and the principles and the purpose of the organization and trying to get to what should they as the CEO do on all of that. So lots, lots in there to unpack. Uh, if, you, if you read the book on this whole topic of connecting with stakeholders, lots of puts and takes. Uh, it's, a, it's a big topic now, though, for CEOs relative to, call it, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think, I think you, you nailed it. it. It used to just not matter it was just make money right and now people care the, the 
consumer cares about. Yeah, your customer what, cares, right? That's the biggest reason in many ways yeah, you've yeah. got to do it, right? Yeah, your customer cares about what you stand for, and they want you yeah. to make a stand one way or the other. And some of these stands that some of these CEOs take can be very detrimental to the company based on if they don't quite understand who their consumer is. Right. So I think I think that's very important. And like you said, you know, it used to be ten percent; it was probably less than ten percent, and now it's you know up to up to fifty percent of the time. And then right. you got to think like that because the world is so transparent now; it's at your fingertips information you can i can figure something out in 30 seconds on google that we used to i wouldn't even know existed you know 30 years ago so i think that's right. a very very good point that that you bring up in the book but here's the one i really wanted to dive into which is personal energy let's talk about that yeah so uh, this is one that uh, it takes ceos a little while to figure out uh, most of them would say in the first year we were a complete disaster in terms of personal effectiveness you know, you know, nothing can really prepare you for the role. Um, but once they figure it out, they're pretty good at it. And I think that the three messages again here, the first was life ends up being not a marathon or a sprint, but really a series of sprints. And in that context, it becomes really important to manage both your time and your energy. And so these CEOs talk a lot about being relentless on their calendar management. The, the mindset is really, let me do only what I can do, right? Let me do only what I can do. And so they're relentless on calendar management, but they're also relentless on energy management, right? They realize that if you're doing this for the long run, you got to keep a high level of energy to keep you know everyone motivated, keep yourself motivated. And so whether that's exercise or, or vacations or finding time in the context of a day to rejuvenate yourself. They talk a lot about renewal. They talk a lot about uh, re-energizing themselves. They talk a lot about recovery, uh, uh, you, you know, in terms of kind of bringing, bringing the energy back. Um, uh, so that, that was kind of message number one is life. You're going to manage life as a series of sprints. So manage your time and manage your energy. The second thing I learned uh, uh, about their personal, uh, uh, their that their personal effectiveness is, they are amazing at compartmentalizing. Uh, you know, bad things are going to happen to CEOs in the context of a month, a week, often in the context of a day. And your ability to kind of just park issues as they hit you so that you can continue to be effective in other forums. One, one insurance CEO said to me, he walks into a meeting, he's with his chief legal counsel, gets told they're going to have to pay about 2 billion euros on a particular issue, heads reeling, walks right out of that meeting into a 3,000 person town hall and said, I was a complete disaster. All I'm thinking about is the lawsuit when I needed to motivate 3,000 people. So from that day onwards, always learned the value of compartmentalizing and being able to park issues, come back to them in a timely way. And then the final piece around personal effectiveness really came down to the fact that these great CEOs um, uh, were really kind of servant leaders at the end of the day. I found them to be authentic, humble, great listeners. Yes, they've got vision, they've got passion, they know the direction, but they're also great listeners, great learners, and very, very good at working through others. I think, Vic, you nailed all three things right there. Uh, I moved out here. I had no idea what it meant to be a CEO. Some may say I still don't know what it means to be a CEO, but I knew that I needed to take care of myself if I was going to be able to run this company effectively. And so I started a, a regimen of exercise and meditation. And I think you nailed it with renewal and rejuvenation. You can only give what you have. And if you're, you know, you, you, you work so many hours, you work so hard, you need to put in that time downtime that vacation time is very important i highly encourage all my leaders to use their time and not just to use it to sit at home and and keep working behind the scenes but to actually go somewhere and disconnect and kick their feet up on a chair and whatever makes them, them happy because you can't you can't lead effectively you will burn out after a certain amount of time um right and i think right. the other thing you said was compartmentalization I was really bad at that when I first started leading the organization. I would hear some news like someone was quitting or someone was going to another company or 
we were losing a client and I would let that affect my communication across the rest of the day to the team. And they would really feel, feel me at my worst. And I had to learn how to compartmentalize. It took me probably a year or two how to do such. And I think it's something that uh, all CEOs need to know how to do. It's very, very important. So thank you for all those tips and going running through all the tenets of this book. I think it's got to be on all the audience's uh, list of things to do in the next couple of months. Go get this book and, and get, a, get a good read. So, Vic, I want to really thank you for coming on the show today. I really appreciate the time. It's been great. Um, let the audience know how they can get a hold of you if they would like to do so. Uh, well, uh, they can they can uh, uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, uh, they can uh, they can reach out to me through the McKinsey website at McKinsey.com, dot um, or they can always email me directly at Vic underscore Malhotra at McKinsey dot com as well. So uh, I'm easy to find. I'm easy to find. Well, Vic, again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Uh, and again. Good luck with the success of the book and keep keep it going. And I know what I'm doing right after the show. So audience, until next time. Thank you for tuning in. I hope that today's episode inspired you to become a purpose-driven leader in your career or your community. There's no doubt that when we lead with purpose, we can change lives. If you enjoyed today's show, I'd be grateful if you would take a moment to rate us on your preferred listening platform. To learn more about Branded Group's Be Better experience and how we provide industry-leading, on-demand facility maintenance, construction management, and special project implementation, visit us at www.branded-group.com. Be sure to follow us on social media, and you can also reach out to me directly on LinkedIn. Until next time, be better. Produced by HeartCast Media.